Hi, everybody. This is Rob Swatsky from the York campus of Hack. And in this podcast, we'll be focusing on the structure and function of the neuromuscular junction and its role in muscle contraction. The neuromuscular junction, often abbreviated the NMJ, is the region between a skeletal muscle fiber and a somatic motor neuron. Remember that somatic motor neurons are the specific nerve cells that excite skeletal muscle fibers to contract. Think of the NMJ as the point where the muscle action potential begins. The NMJ is a specific type of synapse, which is the area where a neuron and a muscle fiber communicate. Synapses are also found in between two neurons, or between a neuron and another type of target cell, such as a gland cell. The method by which neurons communicate with other cells is called synaptic transmission. The synapse is not a physical connection. There is no membrane-to-membrane contact. There is a small space that separates the neuron and the muscle fiber called the synaptic cleft. The cleft is the region that must be crossed in order for the action potential to continue from the neuron to the muscle fiber. This is accomplished by the neuron's release of a messenger chemical called a neurotransmitter, which diffuses across the cleft to the muscle fiber membrane, which we know is called the sarcolemma. As the motor neuron reaches the NMJ, its axon terminal, the end of the neuron, branches into a group of knob-like extensions called the synaptic end bulbs. This is the part of the neuron that associates specifically in the NMJ. There are hundreds of tiny membrane sacs called synaptic vesicles located inside the end bulbs, which contain high concentrations of a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, symbolized as ACH. Acetylcholine is the messenger chemical that will be secreted out of the neuron and into the synaptic cleft. At the other end of the synaptic cleft is the motor end plate. This is the part of the muscle fiber cell membrane that is part of the NMJ. There are tens of millions of integral membrane receptor proteins called acetylcholine receptors that bind to acetylcholine. The acetylcholine receptor proteins are actually ligand gated ion channels that need two molecules of acetylcholine to bind to it in order to open up the channel. The motor end plate is folded and invaginated with deep grooves called junctional folds that create a large surface area for the acetylcholine receptors. Remember that the more membrane surface area you have through these folds, the more proteins can be embedded within the membrane and the more acetylcholine molecules can bind to carry out the muscle action potential. Learning how the nerve action potential, or impulse, triggers a muscle action potential is as easy as your ABCs. Remember that one nerve impulse triggers one muscle action potential. The first step is step A, A standing for acetylcholine release. When the nerve action potential reaches the synaptic end bulb, the change of voltage from negative to positive causes voltage-gated, or VG, calcium ion channels to open within the membrane. Calcium ions at high concentrations in the extracellular fluid diffuse into the neuron through these channels, which causes the synaptic vesicles to undergo exocytosis. The vesicles fuse with the neuron's membrane and secrete their acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft, which diffuses across the cleft to the motor end plate of the muscle fiber. The next step B is binding. 
two molecules of acetylcholine bind to an acetylcholine receptor on the motor end plate. These receptor proteins are actually gated sodium ion channels. These channels are normally closed, but when acetylcholine binds to them, they open. Step C is when the channels open. The receptor's ion channel opens as the two acetylcholines bond to it, and sodium ions can flow into the muscle fiber. Step S to finish up your ABCs is when sodium soaks into the muscle fiber. As the sodium ions flow into the muscle fiber, down their electrochemical gradient from a high positive charge to a low positive charge, the inside of the muscle fiber becomes more positively charged. This change in charge from negative to positive is called depolarization. This change in charge triggers the muscle action potential, which is then propagated across the entire muscle fiber in both directions, traveling along the sarcolemma and down the T-tubules. The action potential then triggers the release of calcium ions from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the sarcoplasm of the muscle fiber, and then the muscle contraction cycle begins. This process repeats if another nerve impulse releases more acetylcholine. The binding of acetylcholine to the receptor proteins is short-lived due to the breakdown of acetylcholine by an enzyme found in the synaptic cleft called acetylcholine esterase, or abbreviated ACHE. Acetylcholine esterase breaks down acetylcholine into its separate products, neither of which can trigger a muscle action potential. When there are no more action potentials in the motor neuron, acetylcholine release stops, and acetylcholine esterase quickly breaks down whatever acetylcholine is left within the synaptic cleft. The calcium ions are pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and the calcium ion release channels within the SR membrane close. There are several drugs that can block certain activities happening at the NMJ. Botulinum toxin, which is made by the bacterium Clostridium botulinum, works by blocking the release of acetylcholine by the synaptic vesicles at the NMJ. Since acetylcholine is not released into the synaptic cleft, muscle contraction cannot be triggered. Botulinum toxin is better known because it's the first bacterial toxin to be used as a medicine, which you may be familiar with as the drug Botox. Botox is often used cosmetically to relax facial muscles that cause wrinkles, and is also used therapeutically to treat lower back pain.